Uh, good day. Thank you all for taking the time uh, to attend today's webinar. My name is Oksana and I am Grand CM's Management Assistant. Uh, the organization represented by Grand CM and Ahua Aviation Services, Maintenance Engineering Consulting Services. So today we talk about purchasing an aircraft. Our speakers, Daniel Granja, Grand CM founder and chief technical officer, and Jacob Plumberg, Ahua Aviation Services Managing Director. Uh, what we know and what we do from our perspective, uh, air awareness, maintenance, engineering, consulting services. Hi, my name is Daniel. I am uh, the founder and chief technical officer of Grand CM. We are a network of consultants over different parts of the world, and we usually do every type of work related to consultancy in the aeronautical maintenance and airworthiness uh, spectrum, to say so. I have been working uh, since 2012. It's already 10 years of experience that I have. And thanks for inviting me. Thanks, Oksana. Thanks, Jake. Nice to see you guys. Good to see you too, thank you. And hello, everybody. My name is Jacob Plumberg. I'm the Managing Director of Ahua Aviation Services. I started in aviation in 1998 as a records junior administrator. And I've worked my way through MROs, airlines, primarily through what was then Flying Colors, into JMC, Thomas Cook Airlines, onto SR Technics as part of the EasyJet redelivery team. Uh, and then moved into consulting in 2005. Uh, so for the last 17 years, I've been bounced around the world for various places. And for the last, I would say, at least five years, um, I've been working remotely and then obviously coordinating the efforts of the AHUA team. Uh, again, a group of uh, consultants and uh, associated network partners located around the world to best serve the, the requirements of our, of our customers. So. My speciality is a word that's management and project management. And uh, yeah, very much look forward to being part of these podcasts as we move forward in the wonderful world of aviation. Looking forward. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's go. The question for Jake. Uh, how long can the technical evolution for purchasing an aircraft take? Um, the true answer to that is that how long is a piece of string? It really depends on who is selling the aircraft, who is purchasing the aircraft, and for what reason. So from the, the area that's, that's Ahura Aviation Services deals in, which is mainly with transactions between lessors. Um, for those types of sales and novations and sales and leases, um, even aircraft disposal at end of life, in my experience, it can vary. I've seen aircraft being sold on lease, which is the aircraft novation. Um, the evaluation of the aircraft uh, usually takes less than a day. Uh, the evaluation of the airworthiness documentation, uh, provided that the airline is disposed to actually provide all of the information requested, can take anywhere from a few days to a week, maybe less. Um, uh usually some factors that not even uh, we can control no like logistics sometimes and stuff like that right absolutely yeah the as i say it really depends on you know what the end uh, objective of the sale is for example if the aircraft is being sold to a different vessel um and the purpose of that sale is for teardown the, the purchasing lessor usually becomes more stringent. I have seen some occasions where the evaluation of the aircraft and its airworthiness documentation has taken up to three months, simply wow. because the, the, airline, the, the lessor that is purchasing the, the aircraft likes to be sure of the, the history, especially when it comes to, to engines and landing gear, life limited parts, the APU, um, the, the constituent assemblies, the hard time components, all the things that have the value within the aircraft that they will then be able to, to break out and then to sell on. Obviously, uh, in recent years, we have seen an uptick in stringent 
requirements that are not necessarily regulatory, but have become a mainstay within the, the commercial aftermarket. And that adds complexity to the whole technical evaluation of the aircraft. If we just switch gears and consider a private sale uh, from one private operator to another private operator, the, the length of time really that that could take normally can be quite quick, although I would advise that it would be preferable for anybody as a private operator purchasing an aircraft to do a full evaluation of the aircraft, including a full valuation of the aircraft, get in contact with a proper uh, appraiser who is able to take a look at the aircraft and give it give you a sense of its true value. In terms of the uh, worthiness uh, evaluation of the aircraft, it would be advisable for anybody purchasing it for private operation to do a full airworthiness review of the aircraft, its uh, airworthiness directive status, its modification status, um, its maintenance program, where it is on the maintenance program, and to evaluate all the documents to validate them to ensure that the previous owner has not missed anything important. And that has happened in the past. So really, for purchasing an aircraft to do it properly, um, from a private point of view, you would want to give it at least at least a month or two to do a good um, deep dive into the airworthiness history and a full evaluation and valuation of the aircraft, uh, the airframe, engines, landing gear itself. So to answer your question shortly, it, it really depends on the situation. Um, but from a private from a private purchaser's perspective, absolutely, I, I would recommend not to get excited and to do the due diligence first. Yeah. It happens. Uh, it happened once as well. One of my clients, he just started uh, with the idea of opening, you know, an airline. And what he did, he already thought, you know, that first of all, he needed to work in uh, marketing, you know, the revenue for it. And uh, what happened is that he ended up selling tickets, and he didn't have the aircraft ready, you know, like. And this is very important what Jake is telling right now, you know, like to consider that it's not something that will happen, you know, in one day or, you know, a couple no, of days. Exactly. And especially with regard, to, from my perspective as uh, an, an old school uh, worthiness records person, <laughs> I know everybody likes to get excited when they see a, a shiny new aircraft or a shiny second hand aircraft, and they just want to get it in the air and start revenue flight. As the, the old adage goes, the, the aircraft will not depart until the records are equal to its end time. Uh, the no next problem. question for Daniel. Uh, what are the costs associated with purchasing an aircraft uh, what an owner may not consider? Well, uh, as Jake was saying moments ago, you know, there's a lot of stuff that uh, goes into paperwork as well that we don't know. Like paperwork can tell you actually the uh, physical uh, stage of the aircraft, you know, like if there are modifications that they may not be contemplating, especially when you have, you know, regulations that are constantly evolving and throwing out ADs with, which are, you know, uh, linked to SBs modifications and you know if you don't have somebody proper with the proper experience and skills maybe you can outlook that you know like you can uh, just go back with the aircraft and then suddenly you check again and you see that you know you have a bunch of stuff that you have to pay for this is modifications this is components it's even tasks like uh, Jake uh, mentioned the MPD tasks I remember there was a company that was uh, delivering the aircraft and we figured out that there were 300 tasks that had wrong last done. And, uh, you know, we were lucky that those last done's uh, didn't influence, didn't impact because this aircraft was for several years under storage. But, you know, these kind of things, if we don't look at them, and we don't uh, filter all of these uh, issues, this can come in very costly later for the owner of the aircraft, you know, for the person that's going to purchase or the entity that's going to purchase the aircraft. And let's also remember that the, the these items that come as a surprise uh, will add to 
the, the, the project for delivery itself. So if the aircraft is undergoing maintenance uh, in order for delivery to its new operator, any of these surprise items that come up at the last minute will extend the project's uh, timeline considerably, which adds not only to additional maintenance costs, additional material and shipping costs, delays in lead time, any, what would you say, like, you know, fines or uh, penalties that may be associated with any contracts or any agreements for onward service. Um, as well as continued payments for insurance, continued payments for, for crews. All of these things start to, to increase and the, the, the cost of these delays of not having the information correct at the beginning within the initial work scope can become exponential. As Daniel says, the, the, the machinery of the industry does not stop. It keeps continuing to, to throw out new ADs and new requirements. So the longer you're on the ground, the more the chance of you having to comply with these uh, before you take off, it increases. And that's, uh, yeah, that's simply. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Daniel. The next questions for our both speakers. Uh, what cost associated with the completion uh, of a purchase project should an owner be aware of? Well, uh, let's say it depends, right? It's if it's going to be a specialist whose residence is in the country where it, this has to happen, or he's from outside, right? There are logistics involved, and all of this uh, depends on the rate. Actually, that uh, we agree with uh, with our client. I don't know how you do it, Jake. What is your thinking about this? Yeah, I I would take this from the. Um from the private owner's perspective, simply because in, in the lesser environment, they already have a lot of experience in the, what the hidden costs may be. Um, so they are usually able to, to preempt those and to handle those and to budget for them rather well. Um, in the case of a private owner, um, it's important that they understand the ongoing cost of operating you know, a private aircraft. And in general, you know, they understand that maintenance has to be done um, and that that's an ongoing cost. However, if they do not do the due, the due diligence um, to understand the actual status of the aircraft, in particular, the, the evolving and changing operational regulations. For example, uh, you know, here in North America, it's now mandatory for all aircraft to, uh, to be ADSB compliant. And obviously, if they want to do that, they need to have compliance for RBSN. I mentioned this because I had um, experience of trying to help a private owner um, with his Cessna citation. Now this aircraft was, shall we say, vintage, and it was not ADSB compliant, it was not RBSM compliant, and the desire of the owner was that he would be able to, to operate the aircraft into the United States. With the new regulations and his modification status and the avionics status of the aircraft, he wasn't able to do that, and so I was tasked to to find a solution for him at a reasonable price. Unfortunately, with the current avionic configuration this aircraft had, although a potential STC did exist, it was not applicable for the, the setup that he had in his aircraft. The result of that, in order to, in order to put the aircraft back into a configuration where it could operate in the US, the asking price for the solution was in excess of $500,000, according to one quotation that I received. Um, so the result of that was uh, he had to dispose of the aircraft um, in a different manner. And he's, he's now looking for a fully compliant aircraft, um, which again has increased his, his own costs in terms of what he was able to recoup from the sale of the aircraft. And now what he's looking to do to, to purchase a new one. But hopefully that's a lesson learned for him. and. You know, later on when he comes to do that again, he will turn to people like us to, to help guide him through it. Correct, yes. And it happens uh, usually that, uh, you know, they save a lot of costs, you know, with the uh, hiring specialists like us that are looking through all that bunch of paperwork, going through everything, you know, checking, uh, cross-checking physically with the aircraft. And uh, they feel that, so they go again, they ask again, you know, like, Hey, thanks. Next question. Um, for longer term projects, how can rotating personnel um, be of benefit to the project? 
for both speakers? <laughs> well, this is a difficult question, right? Because uh, if it's one only project, and we discussed this before with Jake, and I agree, you know, like if it's only one project, it has to be one specialist till the end, mm -hmm. right? But from the other perspective, like I haven't seen projects longer than, let's say, 10 months. <laughs> what do you think? It's not more than two weeks, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes it happens, you know, that they say we need you for a week or two, and then at the end, of the day, you're like, Four months or something like that, you know, working. But it is what it is, you know. Like it happens a lot with uh, customers that, uh, as Jake mentioned, that do not consider certain stuff, and at the end they see that there's no other way than just, you know, having somebody there to do the job. What do you think, Jake? Is your perspective? Yeah, you know, people's personal lives also also play into this as well. You know, events happen. Um, Things change, and especially on longer projects, people get, um, you know, they get tired, they, they start to get fatigued. And that's when, you know, issues and problems and mistakes uh, can creep in. So, especially on, on longer projects, uh, although, I'd say, there has been a move for, for people to, to be on site and to stay on site. And in my experience, the maximum, really, that somebody can be on site fully focused on the project is in essence between six to, to eight weeks, anything beyond that. And, you know, people start to really get, you know, quite fed up, they get homesick, they they start having problems in their, their personal lives because, you know, families, children, <laughs> schools, events, weddings, yeah, you know, all that sort of stuff. You know. And whenever something, one thing that I've always, always said is that uh, the project management have a satellite that's there in the sky that is constantly monitoring what I'm doing. And whenever I try to do something like, you know, have a normal life, they just nail me to the floor and say, no, this is not the right time for the project. You've got to stay. So that needs to be taken into consideration you know, ahead of time to be able to rotate people in and out, to be enable them to have the downtime so they can recharge, refresh and reprogram and come back again, you know, with a fresh pair of eyes, wash the brain out of, of all the stress. It's, an incalculable, incalculable value um, to the project. Otherwise, you know, what do you want uh, to put it in another airy radiation? Do you want a pilot that's tired or do you want a pilot that is it's ready, refreshed and sharp minded? Um, that the cost of mistakes coming in for the, the former is can be catastrophic. Thank you. Next question for um, both speakers. Uh, what are the benefits of building trust between project lead and consultancy companies? Jake, will you take this first? Sure. Um, building trust in, between the, the consultancy and the, uh, well, the, the purchaser of the services, uh, essentially. I would, in, in, recent, in recent years, what I've seen is a uh, quite a high turnover of consultants um, going into projects and leaving projects and then a long period of time between the next one. Um, back in the old days, uh, <laughs> without, you know, it wasn't too long ago, but, but long enough, it was common enough that you know, a project manager would establish a team of people that um, he would then get to know and they would then understand, you know, in turn, his own requirements, his way of working, what is, uh, what his priorities were within the project and how you know people can then work together. It starts to build a team environment um, so that people and teams, whether they are on site or whether they are thousands of miles apart, can start to work, can start to work better together. If you constantly have a high turnover of a different person, then with a different person, a different person, that whole team building process is destroyed and it has to start again. So the benefits of actually spending the time and building the team um, that you know you can trust, that you know you can rely on, that you understand their strengths and weaknesses and how they work, how they react within the project. Um, to me, you know, at least in, in, my, in my mind, is, is massive. It, it really is. Once you reach that level of trust um, and you can consolidate as a, as a team, then you can bounce people from project to project to project. It has the benefit from the consultancy side of them knowing that they're you know, part of something bigger, but also that there is a continuity of work that's 
at least within you know a short break period, they know that there's usually going to be something coming. From the the, the buyer's point of view, they also understand then that there's a level of, of dedication there, a level of commitment that at times within contracting is sorely missing. Although the inverse can also be true. There are consultants out there who believe that they are employees at, at times. And when it's made clear to them through circumstance and things happening that they are contractors, uh, the psychological blow to them could be, can be quite heavy. So it's to find balance between understanding the situation that you are in, building the trust, and uh, the benefits uh, go both ways, in, in my opinion. So what, what do you think of that? Dan? Of course, it's communication. Like, it has to be communication, number one. And uh, I like something that you told that you said a moment ago. You said something about uh, having, doing things right, you know, when you're doing a good job. And uh, I think that when a customer sees at the end of the day, you know, the result of the job, this also builds trust. And I think this is maybe the success, you know, when they give you a chance, you know, because it, it depends as well, because honestly, uh, personally on my side, I know that it is difficult, you know, for companies to open the doors for the first time, you know, to another organization who is going to do such a delicate job, you know, such a, uh, a job that involves millions and of that's dollars. Where the trust and building that trust becomes the, you know, the foundation of everything else that will, that will follow. Uh, we remind you that you can see all the information about Grand CM and AHU Aviation Services online form. Any device is connected to the internet. Just search for AHU Aviation Services or Grand CM on LinkedIn or visit GrandCM.com and check our partners. Uh, the next question for Jake. Um, what uh, what advice do you have for people uh, new to consulting or those uh, considering it uh, as a career change? Advice for people new to consulting or those considering it as, as a career change? Um, right. for, the, for those considering it as a career change, um, particularly those who have been working within airlines or MROs, you know, qualified engineers, uh, they may bump into us from time to time and see us sat smiling and happy in our offices as we dig through through mountains of paperwork or walking around the aircraft with a cup of coffee in hand and they think, that's the life for me. Um, you must be aware that you are becoming a self-employed person. And that's the, the, that is the fundamental fact of this. You will not no longer be an employee. You can say goodbye to any seniority that you had. In a lot of cases, uh, you know, licenses come at risk because of a uh, continuation. You're not always able to, to log the hours. So I've heard of many and come across many people who were licensed engineers in the beginning and uh, they haven't been renewed. Um, so if that's an important aspect of it for you, then maybe it's, it's not advisable. The other part of starting off as, as a consultant is the learning curve. And it's a learning curve that expects you to hit the ground running, to meet the expectations of the customer, their demands and wins um, whenever it needs to be and whenever the project uh, determines. Also, no consider to avoid the learning curve, right? Oh, There's no you can't avoid it. It's, it's a cliff in front of you. It's just there and you have to climb it one way or another. Sometimes some people fall off. Just be aware that you are now completely on your own. Um, you will not necessarily have the backing of a larger organization behind you. You will be expected at time to spend a long time away from home. Um, so if your home life isn't conducive to that, then it, this may not be for you. Or be prepared to live like a hermit for a few months. Um, that, the first time, the first project I, I went on, I was sent to Singapore and I ended up staying in a $30 a night hotel because that's all I could afford. And it was in some of the more colorful areas of, of Singapore, which was interesting, but uh, <laughs> noisy at times. So there's that aspect as well. Finally, um, in terms of when you're starting the, the process, take your time and evaluate all of your objectives, all of the requirements that are being asked of you. Try and deliver more than you uh, are asked to do. 
do it in a, a detailed approach. Do it in a way that is at a high level of presentation. There, there are some times I've seen people who will do analysis of information and they're not used to, to using Microsoft products. So they send you a spreadsheet and it looks like a spider's web and it's unintelligible. So brush up on your, your administrative skills using Word, how to write letters, how to create and format properly spreadsheets and information. Um, you won't always be walking around fixing aircraft. You may want to, but sometimes you're in the office there and you have to act like the entire engineering department. So the stress can be, can be quite high. And on that level, above all things, take care of yourself as, as much as possible. There are many, many health potholes that you can fall into uh, that can create health problems down the line from high blood pressure <laughs> to <laughs> obesity to uh, you know, heart problems, to stress, to nervous problems, to mental health issues. Okay, in some cases, to mention this, well. it can have devastating yeah. effects on your personal life, including um, and up to including uh, death. The relationship okay. with the family as well can be compromised or jeopardized there. Yeah, well, it's, okay. it's hard, it is a hard life. Understand it? It is a hard life. At times, it can be very well rewarding. Um, you know, physically, personally, professionally, as well as financially. Um, but there are many pitfalls to be aware of, so don't jump into it lightly. Um, speak to people you may know, and yeah, take it step by step, and just above all, look after yourself. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, Jake. No, no problem. Summarizing, Jake, uh, let's go from your question. Sure. Um, I, I think what has, has come out of this, you know, the various questions about you know, cost and associated and you know, trust and what people need to be aware of when, when purchasing an aircraft, whether that's I mean, maybe not so much from the, the lessor side because they more or less have their, their acts together most of the time. Uh, but from a private purchaser's perspective, the main focus really has to be anticipate the unknown, uh, be cautious. Do the due diligence. Look at the information. Look at the aircraft. Bring in, you know, bring in a fully qualified appraiser to look at the aircraft to give you an idea of its of its value if you're not already aware of it. But above all, um, do not get excited too much about buying the aircraft. Make sure that you understand what it is, what you're getting into, and what it's going to cost you going forward. Um, any mistakes on this to you could be, from my perspective, yeah, pretty bad. But if you get it right, then it's clear flying the entire way, the wings level. Yeah, I think we can summarize as well saying that uh, if you don't do it with experts, it's going to cost a lot, of a lot of money, you know. We remind our listeners that you can send us your questions and we can be answering them. Yeah. And if there's anything that you would like us to, to discuss, or even if you would like to make an appearance as a guest presenter uh, for one of the, the subsequent podcasts, then please get in contact with us through LinkedIn or through our other uh, other channels. And we'll be happy to, to talk to you about what you, you want to see. So, um, Daniel, so, so what other things can we expect from this podcast series going forward? We are thinking about... Uh... New subjects, you know, subjects that are not uh, so typical and that, uh, you know, that are not easy to find. Like, usually when we are working as consultants, as you may know already by experience, like 80% of this job is not written anywhere, you know, like <laughs> everything is like pieces written here, pieces written there of how to do what, you know, like. How does the bleed system work, for example? How does a valve work? But nobody tells you the process of, you know, checking all of this, knowing about engineering, plus knowing about the, the commercial side, the logistical side, to say so, right? The things that are involved uh, that you don't see, like. And There's also, that learning curve again, so hopefully we can help to give a few people some ladders. <laughs> exactly, exactly, that's the idea. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, we remind our viewers that uh, they can leave their comments under this video. Painted, we will be answering them in the next postcard maintenance planning. That's all.
Good. Yeah.